Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. Today we're talking to Zoe Baker, historian and YouTuber. She tells us what it's like talking about anarchism on YouTube and offers some advice about the format. If you've watched any of Zoe's videos, you'll know that she doesn't show her face and we've respected that in this interview. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share. Hi, my name is Zoe Baker. I've recently submitted my PhD about the revolutionary strategy of anarchism in Europe and the United States between 1868 and 1939. I'm a philosopher, as is my kind of intellectual background, and then I accidentally became a historian of political theory during the PhD. And so my focus is on explaining what the positions and arguments of dead anarchists are in a way that is clear and accessible to a modern audience. The idea is, is that I don't expect loads of modern people to sit down and read the complete, complete works of Bakunin or Kropotkin or Goldman, Malatesta and so on, and then loads of like history books. The idea is, is that, well, I can do this and I can then explain the main points um, so that people who don't have the time or energy to learn these things can, can learn about them. And in order to spread that research to as many people as possible, I make YouTube videos. So I've been making YouTube videos for almost 10 years now, and I somehow ended up building up an audience who like my videos, and so now it's my job to explain anarchism, Marxism and feminism to strangers on the internet which is um, kind of a weird situation to be in, but it's, it's a nice one. We do press on and are born Growing up, I wanted to be an academic, but then I realised what the nature of modern universities are, so I decided that being a YouTuber was a better option. What it's like to be a anarchist YouTuber is that I have way more creative freedom than lots of academics working in universities. I don't have to repackage my anarchist ideas so that a big journal edited by liberals will publish it. I don't have to jump through hoops to get research grants. Each month I just sit down and think, what do I want to make a video on? And then I make it. And like my only limitation is the terms and conditions of YouTube as a website. <laughs> so I can't make things that violate its terms of service because then they will like ban me from the website, but that's quite difficult to do. So it's kind of, there's a lot of options and possibilities where I don't have to alter my ideas in a way that fits in with larger ed like academic institutions. And this isn't to say that being a YouTuber is this kind of purely amazing uh, thing. There are loads of negatives that come along with it, just in virtue of what it's like to be a public figure on the internet. So people are mean to me on Twitter every day. I have to block people for being transphobic. Uh, I have fans who form parasocial relationships with me. And so they interact with me as if we're friends and know each other when they're a total stranger to me, just because they've consumed uh, my content. And so they feel like they know me when they don't. Uh, I've had people accuse me of being COINTELPRO and like a cop <laughs> who's somehow trying to undermine socialism by explaining socialism on the internet. I have people claiming I've said certain things that I haven't and there's kind of nothing you can really do to stop these things from happening. And every YouTuber has their own version of these kinds of like negatives and the bigger you are, the worse they are. So there's kind of, there's a level of internet fame that I would never want to reach <laughs> because with it comes way, way more of these kinds of negatives. Um, even if you're reaching more people, it's kind of a inherent problem with parasocial relationships and kind of internet culture at this point and how fandoms relate to creators that I don't really see changing. I think there are three main reasons why it's important to be engaging with anarchist ideas through the medium of YouTube. So firstly, most academic books and articles are read by a tiny number of people who are the kind of person who is already looking for academic literature. There are a few big names on the left who do reach a large audience. So people like David Graeber, who sadly passed away recently, Noam Chomsky, uh, David Harvey, and people like that. 
But the much more common situation is left-wing academics are only read by other left-wing academics for a variety of reasons to do with, you know, paywalls, the accessibility of the writing style, people even knowing of their existence in the first place. Like there are loads of really good anarchist historians that anarchists in the movement might not know of. And the reason why is because their books are published by university presses and cost like a hundred pounds, even though the content is, is, you know, really good and interesting. And lots of left-wing academics have discussions about, well, how can we reach a audience outside of the university? And I think YouTube is a way that people can easily do this because all you need is a microphone, a computer, and some time to learn how to ed edit audio and, and make a video. And one of the strengths of YouTube is that I can make a video that will be viewed by thousands of people from all different kinds of countries, background, and age group. So I can look at my analytics and I'm watched by people who live in Vietnam. I'm watched by people who live in India. My audience is mainly in uh, America and England because all my videos are in English. But even within that, I get messages from people from all kinds of different backgrounds, like thanking me for the videos. So people who have never gone to university, people who are busy all the time uh, working a really terrible job, they like my videos because they don't have the time to do loads of reading because of their situation, but they can watch my videos and learn about these topics that they're interested in. And I think that to me, this is kind of the modern equivalent of what a lot of historic anarchists did, where they would um, write for mainstream publications rather than just small uh, or smaller anarchist ones. And I think YouTube is one of these equivalent platforms in the modern world because you can reach anyone with an internet connection, anyone who uses uh, the website. And there are difficulties with the way the YouTube algorithm works and it can not be super nice to radical content compared to like, you know, videos about unboxing things you recently bought. <laughs> but it's still much better than, say, an academic article behind a paywall, which is read by the other academics you know. And that's because you said, hey, I recently wrote this article. You should, you know, uh, look at it. The second reason why I think it's important to engage uh, with YouTube is that, as I kind of touched on briefly before, is it's a really accessible way to spread information. And there are lots of people who, they struggle with reading for various reasons. So you have people with dyslexia or ADHD, people who are really mentally ill, and mental illness is, as far as I recall, the leading cause of disability worldwide, or people just being really tired from working a job they hate. and people go on to YouTube as a platform independently of wanting to learn anarchism, then can come and come into contact with these ideas and be radicalized through it and, and learn about the topic. And I think that's like a, a really valuable thing. And thirdly is that the YouTube algorithm has a tendency to funnel people towards right wing content. So, uh, as, and especially young people. So what will happen is you have a teenager who's watching videos about video games. And then the algorithm goes, well, you like stuff about video games. You also like this video, which is about how feminists are destroying video games. And then they keep clicking more and more content that gets recommended like that. And then they end up watching actual fascists and going down this, um, what's called the alt-right uh, pipeline. And given the existence of this um, on YouTube, I think it's important for left-wing people to make political content that tries to counteract this trend. And this is already something that's been happening with people like ContraPoints or Philosophy Tube, who are kind of two of the um, much more famous uh, left-wing YouTubers. But I think there can be uh, lots more other, you know, smaller voices who are also trying to spread radical content and counteract uh, young people, especially being radicalized into the far right and racism and patriarchy and so on through uh, the internet. So some people might think there's a contradiction between being an anarchist and promoting anarchism on YouTube, which is owned by Google. It's a super massive evil corporation. Um, and this is also just true of, you know, social media in general, like why should anarchists spread, try to spread ideas through Facebook or Twitter and so on, um, as opposed to using, say, kind of open source alternatives uh, and various uh, more niche websites that have been created by anarchists. 
uh, as an alternative to the dominant uh, platforms. I think in existing class society, our options are very much limited by the structures uh, which surround us. And in our current context, if you want to reach the majority of people with uh, anarchist ideas, then you have to use uh, social media because it's how uh, you can reach them. And these people won't be on the really obscure uh, open source or anarchist uh, websites. Um, and so if you do use those websites, you're really just preaching to the choir and often a really small niche part of that anarchist choir. Loads of anarchists aren't even on these platforms. <laughs> um, and so it's often, you know, only a subset even of anarchists who are using them. Um, and so to reach the biggest number of people and thereby try to spread the ideas as wide as possible, it means using these platforms owned by these terrible corporations who are deliberately making people addicted to social media in order to generate as much uh, data as possible to then sell that to advertising, right? That's their business model. And you are participating in that by using it. Um, but I think the positives of reaching a large audience outweighs those negatives. And it should also be done while being aware of the fact that you're as it were, in enemy, enemy territory, and at any point they can get rid of your platform. Um, so Facebook has deleted loads of anarchist Facebook pages. Um, there are Twitter accounts that have been taken down by anarchists. Um, I expect the same will happen uh, with uh, YouTube uh, channels, and it's something I'm kind of worried about uh, a lot of the time uh, with really making sure I don't do anything that violates the terms of service so they have no opportunity to uh, delete my channel and thereby my platform to reach loads of people um, and so it's this thing where it, there's a sense in which you don't have control of the platform because it's run by a massive corporation you can take you off at any point but you can also be there for an extended period of time without that occurring uh, and in so doing do a lot of good it's just a kind of uh, potentially temporary situation given that they have power over whether or not you're on their website and they often don't like left-wing people using their websites to uh, spread uh, revolutionary ideas because they are capitalists unsurprisingly they're not super keen on uh, on communism we are real the advice i'd give to anarchists wanting to use youtube as a platform is kind of quite practical so the first thing would be make sure you have good audio quality if the audio sounds bad people will just click off very quickly um, you don't need video and if you do use video it doesn't have to be like a you know amazing camera people can handle lower quality visuals uh, much better than they can handle it sounding you know unpleasant to listen to so buy a dedicated microphone a usb microphone is fine uh, you can get a more fancy microphone if you're really serious, but like it's not compulsory. Most YouTube channels never become large, so don't go into it expecting to become like, I'm going to have a million subscribers and change the world. It's like most YouTube channels on any topic, let alone anarchism, remain very small because there are so many channels and there's a limited audience and the algorithm only recommends a limited number of them. Uh, and so it's kind of the system itself me of how the website's organized means that even if you're supposedly doing all the things you're meant to do to grow for whatever reason that I don't think even the people at YouTube understand this doesn't happen. The algorithm kind of has a mind of its own. And so I think it's better to compare views or subscribers to things like how many people will read this article behind a paywall or how many people read this zine that is in like a small niche subculture. And in comparison to that, you can reach, say, a thousand people, uh, which is very large relative to 10 people or 20 people. And that can do a lot of good. And it can also have kind of these weird like net effects where, for example, I've made videos that have persuaded people who've then gone on to be much bigger YouTubers than me. And they've then reached way more people than I ever have. And so I contributed with my much smaller channel towards a larger audience being influenced by uh, radical ideas, even though they're not being directly influenced by me uh, as an individual. So you can also try to think more in terms of 
groups of people rather than just you as an individual channel and where you're kind of part of a trend rather than this kind of isolated individual. And if you want to grow fast, there are certain things which YouTube as a website uh, seems to prefer when it comes to recommending your content to people. And that is response videos. People like conflict, they like people disagreeing with each other, and they're more likely to click on a video that's you having a go at someone else than you just talking about uh, things in general. But that doesn't mean that as an anarchist YouTuber, you have to buy into the kind of dominant form of, say, response video, where you're being like a debate bro, owning someone with facts and logic. You can do response videos in a way where you're polite, you're not attacking them as a person, you're just explaining why they're wrong. And I try to do that because I don't want to kind of feed into a lot of the more negative parts of social media. And I don't want to create a situation where my fans will then go be terrible to the person I'm responding to. Um, I'm trying to set a, I don't want to say good example, but more like this is a healthy or more um, effective way of communicating with people you disagree with than kind of shouting at them and calling them names and attacking them as a person. So I just try to make the arguments and focus on that. But even response videos that aren't super combative will still do like way better than just making a video called What is Anarchism? Um, and I wish that wasn't the case. But uh, unfortunately, that's kind of the nature of the website. And then it's also the situation where if you go after, say, right wing YouTubers, then it, you can then experience their fans coming after you and being really abusive towards you as an individual. So I deliberately like avoid responding to right wing YouTubers. I mainly just respond to other uh, left wing YouTubers because their fan bases tend to be uh, less uh, toxic in that way. And so not as kind of scary to, to have to deal with.